Well, thank you for tuning in today. <clears throat> We've got Jim Butcher's Small Favor. This one is book 10 of the Dresden Files. We are almost done with this book, so hopefully you guys have ordered book 11, Turncoat, and have that ready to go. So if you guys would like, share, and subscribe, and grab your copy of the book, let's see what Dresden's plan is here. I mean, he just, uh, <clears throat> I guess, brought out everyone in the area to face the three of them, Sonia, Michael, and him. And then they've got six denarians, and then they've got all these guys with uh, guns ready to shoot, and they've got all these beasts out there ready to go as well. Um, wow, this is, this is going to be interesting. Let's see what happens. I didn't see what happened to the sword. I'd just thrown it toward Michael. I plunged my hand into my duster and came out with a shot off shotgun. I dropped my staff, lifted the gun in both hands, turned my face away and shouted, fire in the hole a second before I'd pulled the trigger. Once upon a time, I'd seen Kincaid use dragon's breath rounds against red court vampires in a fight at Wrigley Field. It had been impressive as hell watching those shotgun rounds belch out jets of flame 40 feet long. Since then, I'd done a bit of research on fun things you can fire out of a shotgun. And as it turns out, there's all kinds of interesting stuff you can shoot at people. It's astonishing, really. The creativity that goes into the design of all the different specialized ammunition available on the market today. My personal favorite, a round known as the fireball. It fires out a spray of superheated particles of metal, tiny, tiny bits of metal blazing away at a temperature of over 3,000 degrees. They spread out into an enormous cone of fire and light more than 250 feet long brighter and hotter than any fireworks you've ever seen. Forestry services use them to start backfires, and special weapons units use them to create enormous eye-catching diversions. I unleashed two fireball rounds simultaneously straight up into the air, and for an instant turned that weirdly firelit hilltop as bright as a midsummer noon. Even with my eyes closed and my face turned away, the world turned bright pink through my eyelids. I heard gunfire from the direction of the cottage and more from the tree line off to the left. But whatever gunman Nicodemus had positioned there had been blinded by the flash and it would take them time for their night vision to recover. That had been half the point of using the fireball rounds there in the dark. It wouldn't give us much time to act, no more than a handful of seconds. But a lot can happen in a handful of seconds, if you're willing to use them well. I dropped the shotgun, grabbed my staff, and charged forward, screaming like a madman. Michael and Sonia came hard on my heels. Michael bore Amarachius in his right hand and Fildacius in his left. As he ran, both blades suddenly became limed in a low, flickering silver light. One of the beasts that had been lurking behind the tower had bounded toward Nicodemus' command. Even blinded by the flesh, but it had the bad fortune to rush past me directly at Michael. The Knight of the Cross twisted his body to the left, then right, delivering a pair of slashes with each weapon. They were hissing thumps of swift impact, a scream of pain from the beast, and Michael pounded on, barely even slowing his stride leaving the still-twitching body of the beast on the ground behind him. Then the air shook with the force of Magog's battle roar, and I jerked my gaze around to find the huge denarian thundering directly toward me. I had already tested my will against Magog's power, and I knew I could stop him if I had to do it. I also knew that it would take an enormous amount of effort to manage it, and leave me vulnerable to one of his companions. So instead of trying to stop him, I called upon my will, and as the ape-like creature bore down upon me, I swept my staff in an up-curved stroke like the swing of a golf club and cried, 
Fulzare! The unforeseen force and will reached out, adding to the momentum of Magog's charge and lifting him from the ground with a howl. Magog went flying over our heads and arched out into the air and over the steep, rocky hillside we just climbed. The animalistic howl broke out into savage words in some ancient-sounding tongue, interspersed with screams of fury and grunts of pain as the huge denarian bounced down the stony, frozen hillside. He sounded more angry than injured, and I knew that I'd taken him out of the equation for only a moment at most. Hopefully, that would be enough. Deidre came down from the mound of stones using all four limbs and individual blade strands of her hair interchangeably for locomotion, so that she looked like some kind of bizarre, enormous spider, until Sonya raised his Kulsanov and began firing at her. None of that spray-and-pray automatic fire, either. The Russian skidded to a stop and took swift aim. He bounced one round off a rock an inch to Deidre's left, put a second shot through her thigh and raised a cloud of sparks from the steely blades of her hair near her skull with a third round. She let out a shriek of startled pain and fear and scuttled sideways off into the shadows as swiftly as a roach caught out in the middle of the floor when the light comes on. Gunfire came at us from both sides, still more or less blind and random, but no less lethal for that. Bullets are the damnedest things going by. They aren't dramatic by themselves. They sound almost like big bugs, like something that might buzz by you real fast out in the country on a hot, muggy summer afternoon. It's almost hard to feel afraid of them. Until it truly hits you, you exactly what they are. It's kind of handy, actually. That moment of disconnection between the time your senses tell you that death is flickering around randomly a couple of feet away and the time your mind manages to make you understand that moving around in it is an awful idea. It gives you time to act before you get so scared that you just find a shady spot and stay there. Go! 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 I called, still charging forward. Our only chance was to keep moving ahead, to rattle Nicodemus and company into jumping out of the way, and to get into the only shelter on that hilltop. Kill them, Nicodemus roared, his voice furious. And then there was a sound of rushing wind from overhead. He must have taken to the sky, flying upon the shadow of it, his, as if upon enormous bat wings. More of the beasts had closed on Michael, and both swords were at work again, striking out, silver light gleaming more brightly now for their blades. Sonya let out a shout and more light flooded the hilltop, casting my own shadow out darker in front of me, as Esperachius joined the battle, and more the beasts' cries of pain shook the air. In front of me, Thormd Namshiel howled out in frustration, evident terror in some tongue I didn't know, and I saw that both Tessa and Helmade Rosanna had pulled a vanishing act. Namshiel, his arm outstretched in the general direction of the far side of the stone throne added despair to his voice. Come back! Then he turned toward me as he heard my feet churning through the wet snow. He still had a corner of green light in his spiny hand, and as his eyes focused on my general location, he bared his teeth in a snarl of bitter hatred and flung his hand hurling a sphere of crackling emerald energy at me. My shield bracelet was ready to go, and I had a terror and rage and determination in plenty to empower my defenses. I deflected the sphere at an angle and sent it rebounding harmlessly into the night sky. Amateur puppy, Namichel snarled, and began to gather more sticky green power at his fingertips. He made an odd little gesture and flicked his fingers, and suddenly five tiny threads of green light leapt toward me at five separate spiraling paths. I brought my shield around to intersect the new attack and realized at the last second that each individual thread of energy was coming at me on a slightly different wavelength of the spectrum of magical energy, a variance of frequencies that my shield 
couldn't stretch to cover. Not all at the same time, anyway. I countered three of them and nearly got the fourth, but it slipped by me, and I never even touched the fifth strand. Something that felt like cold, greasy piano wire wrapped around my throat, and I couldn't breathe. Insufferable, arrogant little monkey, Namshell hissed, playing with the fires of creation, binding your soul to it as if you are one of us. How dare you so presume? How dare you wield soul fire against me? I, who was there when your pathetic kind was hewn from the muck. It wasn't so much being strangled to death that I object to, or even the maglomaniac monologue I was being subjected to in the process. I just wished that I knew what the hell he was talking about. Granted, I had busted him up pretty good with that silver hand thing, but he was talking and taking it so freaking personally. I lost track of what I'd been thinking. My head hurt. So did my neck. Thorned Nam Shiel was ranting about something, practically foaming at the mouth, really. Right up until Amarachius flashed in a line of silver fire, and Thorned Nam Shiel's head hopped off of his shoulders, thumped twice, and fell into the snow. Suddenly, I took a deep breath, and the world started sorting itself out again. Michael stepped forward, took one look at Nam Shiel's body, and hewed the right hand off at the wrist. He picked up the hand and dropped it into a pouch on his sword belt. Meanwhile, Sonya shouldered his rifle and dragged me to my feet. Go! I choked out, barely able to get the words out through my half-crushed throat. I regained my own feet and waved Sonya off me, gesturing ahead. The lighthouse! Fast! Go! Sonya looked from me to the hollow tower and promptly sheathed his sword to take up his rifle again. The big Russian advanced to the tower, the Kulsanov at his shoulder. He began putting precise shots through the heads of each of the beasts that had been chained to the walls, inside the torment Ivy, who was still floating, bound within the greater circle. I followed Sonya as quickly as I could, wheezing in breaths through my aching neck. By the time Michael and I had gotten into the shelter of the mostly closed ring of the tower's stones, the gunfire from around us had begun to close in on us again as the gunman's night vision returned. The tiny window of opportunity the flash of the fireball rounds had created had waned. How did you know? Michael asked, panting. How did you know that they would break if we charged them? You don't survive two thousand years in a game like this one without predator reflexes, I replied. Any predator in the world reacts the same way to a loud noise, a bright flash, and a noisy and unexpected charge. They get the hell out of the way. Can't really help themselves. Habit of a couple millennia is a bitch to break. Sonya calmly shot another beast. I shrugged. Nicodemus and company thought that they knew how things were going to proceed, and when they didn't go the way they expected, they got flustered. So, the nickelheads got clear. I pursed my lips. Of course, they were going to be back in a minute, and very upset. Hey there, Marcone. Dresden, Marcone said, as if we'd passed each other outside the coffee shop. He sounded a little tired, but calm, all things considered. That was probably an indicator of exactly how much moxie the crime lord had. Can you help the child? Damn it. That's the thing I hate most about Marcone. Every once in a while he says or does something that makes it difficult to label him scum, criminal, and file him neatly away in a drawer somewhere. I glared at him. He returned the glare with a faint, knowing smile. I muttered under my breath and turned to study the elaborate circle, while Sonya finished the last of the beasts. I've never seen anything like this, Michael said, quietly staring. I didn't blame him. Even among professionals, the circle was impressive. Lots of luminous, glowing lines and swirls involved. And that always looks fantastic, especially at night. The gold and silver and precious stones didn't hurt things either. The light and music show behind, put on by the chimes and crystals, 
added a wonderful little eerie edge to it all, especially given the grotesque art that framed the interior magical symbology. This is some upper-tier stuff, I said quietly. It'll be another century, maybe two, before I'm good enough to come close to this level of work. It's delicate. One single thing, a fraction of an inch out of place, and the whole thing goes kablooey. It's powerful. When you're putting this together, if any one of a couple of dozen of the power flows slips for even an instant, the whole thing goes out of balance and could go up with enough force to blow the top off of this whole hillside. It took a freaking genius to put this together, Michael. I hefted my staff. Fortunately, I said, and took a two-handed swing at the nearest stand of slender, delicate crystal. It shattered with gratifying ease. At the encasing light around the greater circle began to waver and dissipate. It only takes a monkey with a big stick to take it apart. I waded into the circle, smashing things with my staff. It was therapeutic. God knows how many times the bad guys had destroyed the careful work of lifetimes when they'd robbed people of homes, of loved ones, of life itself. It felt sort of nice to bring a little cup of Shiva D into their lives for a change. I shattered the crystals that bent light into a cage to hold the archive prisoner. I bent and mashed the tuning forks that focused sound into chains. I crushed the depictions of bondage and imprisonment meant to restrain the very idea of freedom. And from where I went on to break ivory rune sticks, to crush glyph-scribbed gems, to pound into in inlegibility golden plates inscribed with sigils of imprisonment. I'm not sure at which point I started screaming in outrage. Somewhere along the line, though, it hit me that these people had taken magic, the power of life, of creation, of force meant to create and protect, to learn and preserve, and they had bent and twisted it into blasphemy, an obscenity. They had used it to imprison and torment, to torture and maim, all in an attempt to enslave and destroy. Worse, they had turned magic against the archive, against the safeguard of knowledge itself, and still worse, against a child. I didn't stop until I had shattered their expensive, elaborate, elegant torture chamber, until I could deliberately drag my staff across the last smooth, golden circle at the innermost point of the design, marring it in a way across its surface, breaking the last remaining structure of the spell. <clears throat> the energies of the prison let loose with an outraged howl, sailing straight up into the air overhead in a column of furious purple light. I thought I could see faces twisting and spinning inside it for a few seconds, but then the light faded, and Ivy fell limply to the cold ground, just a naked little girl, bruised and scratched and half unconscious with the cold. Michael was at my side at once, removing his cloak. I took it and wrapped Ivy in it. She made whimpering sounds of protest, but she really wasn't conscious. I picked her up and held her close to me, getting as much of my own coat around her as I could. I looked up and found McCone watching me steadily. Sonya had cut him free from the wall and evidently given the crime lord the cloak off his back. Marcone, now hunched against the sleet in the white cloak, holding one of the chemical warming packs between his hands. He stood just a bit over average height and was of medium build. So Sonya's cloak covered him like a blanket. Will she be all right? Marcone asked. She will, I said with determination. She damned well will. Down, barked Sonya. Bullets raised sparks off the inside of the lighthouse and rattled wildly around its interior. Everyone got down. I made sure I had my body and my duster between Ivy and any incoming rounds. Sonya led out for a second and squeezed off a couple of shots, then hurried back under cover again. The volume of fire from outside grew. They're bringing up reinforcements from down the hill, Sonya reported. Heavier weapons, too. Marcone glanced around the features interior of the ruined lighthouse. 
If any of them have grenades, this is going to be a relatively brief rescue operation. Sonya leaned out and snapped off another pair of shots, barely getting back before returning. Fire started chewing at the stone where he'd been. He muttered under his breath and changed magazines on his rifle. The enemy gunfire suddenly ceased, and there was silence on the hilltop for twenty or thirty seconds. Then, Nicodemus' voice, filled with anger, came through the air. Dresden? What? I called back. I'm going to give you one chance to survive this. Give me the girl. Give me the coins. Give me the swords. Do that, and I'll let you walk away alive. Ha! I said. It was impossible that I didn't feel quite as confident as I sounded. Or maybe I'll just leave from here. Cross into the never-never from where you're standing, Nicodemus said. You'd be better off asking the Russian to put a bullet through your head for you. I know what lives on the other side. Given that they'd chosen this location for the greater circle precisely because it was the source of intense dark energy, I had no trouble believing that it connected to some nasty portions of the Never Never. There was every chance that Nicodemus was not bluffing. How do you know that you won't kill me the minute you get what you want? I called back. Harry, Michael hissed. I shushed him. We both know what my word is, Nicodemus said, his voice dry. <laughs> really, Dresden. If we can't trust each other, what's the point of talking at all? Heh. <laughs> Gaining enough time to await the second half of those fireballs we're supposed to accomplish, that's what. The twin 250-foot jets of fire had briefly blinded our enemies, true. But they'd done something else, too. Marcone tilted his head to one side for a moment and then murmured, Does anyone else hear... strings? Ha! I said, and pumped my fist in the air. Ha 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 ha! Have you ever heard anything so magnificently pompous and overblown in your life? Deep, ringing French horns joined the string sections echoing over the hilltop. What's that? Sonia murmured. That, I crowded, is Wagner, baby. Never let it be said that a chooser of the slain can't make an entrance. Miss Gard brought the reconditioned Huey up from the eastern side of the island, flying about a quarter of an inch over the treetops, blasting the ride of the Valkyries from the loudspeakers mounted on the chopper's underside. Wind, sleet and all, still she flew flawlessly through the night, having used the twin jets of the fireball rounds visible for miles over the pitch-black lake to orient herself to where to arrive. The Huey turned broadside as it rose over the hilltop, music blaring loud enough to shake snow from the treetops. The side door of the chopper was open, revealing Mr. Hendricks manning a rotating-barreled minigun fixed to the deck of the helicopter. Completely illegal, of course. But then, I suppose that's really one major advantage to working with criminals. They just don't care about that sort of thing. The barrels began to spin, and a tongue of flame licked out from the front of the gun. Snow and earth erupted into the air in a long trench in front of the cannon. I risked a peek and saw men clad in dark fatigues leap for cover, as a swath of devastating slewed back and forth across the open hilltop and pounded the mound of stones into a mound of gravel. That's our ride, I said. Let's go. Sonya led the way, firing off more or less random shots at anyone who wasn't already laying flat in an effort to avoid fire from the gun on the helicopter. Some of Nicodemus's troops were crazier than others. Several of them jumped up and tried to come after us. That minigun had been designed to shoot down airplanes. What the rounds left of human bodies was barely recognizable as such. There was no place for the chopper to land, but a line came down from the other side, lowered by a winch while the aircraft hovered above us. I looked up to see Lucio operating the winch, her face pale, but her eyes glittering with excitement. She was how guard 
had been able to know where to look for the signal. I had given Anastasia a couple of my hairs to use in a tracking spell, and she'd been following me ever since I'd left to meet Rosanna for the trade. The line came down with a lift harness attached to it. Marcone, I shouted over the sound of rotors and minigun, which is to say I was more or less mouthing it. Exaggeratingly, you first. That was the deal. He shook his head and pointed his finger at Ivy. I snarled and pushed the girl into his arm, then started slapping the harness over him. He got it after a second, and in a couple more we had him secured in the harness and holding the semi-conscious Ivy tight against him. I gave Lucio the thumbs up, and Marcone and Ivy went zipping gracefully up the line to the chopper. Wrapped in the white cloak, the scarlet crosses on it standing out sharply in the winter light, Lucio helped haul them in. A second later, the empty harness came down again. Sonia, I said. The Russian passed me the Kolsonov and slipped into the harness, then ascended to the helicopter. Again, the empty harness came down. Though now, there were occasional bursts of heavier rounds coming from down the slope of the hillside, as evidenced by tracer fire that would sometimes go tumbling in by the night. It would be immediately answered by a far heavier fire of the minigun. But guard couldn't possibly keep the chopper there for long. Harry, Michael said, offering me the harness. I was about to take it, but by chance I looked up and saw a guard looking down at us through the plexiglass bubble around the pilot's seat, looking at Michael with an absolute unnerving intensity that I had seen on her face once before, and my heart started hammering in terror. The last time she'd looked like that, I'd been in an alley outside Brock Ordered Books back in Chicago, and a necromancer named Corpse Taker and a ghoul named Lee Zan had been about to murder me. A few minutes later, Guard had told Marcone that she had seen that it was my fate to die then and there. The only reason that I survived it was that Marcone had intervened. But even if I'd seen, never seen that look on her face before, I figured that any time a Valkyrie hovering over a battlefield suddenly gets really intense in a particular warrior ain't good. I'd made the grasshopper a promise. If things were about to get hairy for whoever was left on the ground, it wouldn't be Molly's dad that had to deal with it. You first, I said. He started to argue. I shoved the harness into his chest. Damn it, Michael. He grimaced shook his head at me, and then sheathed Amarachius, still holding Fuldacius in his hand. He shrugged quickly into the harness. I gave Lucio the thumbs up and Michael began to rise. Guard frowned faintly, and some of my screaming tension started to ease. Tessa and Rosanna came out from behind veils that were as good as anything Molly could have done. And I didn't have to be Sherlock to deduce who had done the lion's share of the work on the greater circle that had been containing the archive. I had half a second to act, but I got tangled in the strap of Sonya's gun, which he'd handed me so that I could defend myself in case I was suddenly attacked. Thank you, Sonya. Tessa, her pretty human face showing, her eyes gleaming with manic glee, swept a mantis claw at my head, and I at least managed to interpose the rifle before she ripped my head off. Only instead of smashing the gun as I had expected, she ripped it out of my hand just as easily as taking candy from a baby and spun away from me. Then she winked at me, blew me a kiss, and opened fire on Michael with the Kalsanov in full automatic from no more than ten feet away. My friend didn't scream as bullets torn into him. He just jerked once in the spray of scarlet and went limp. Fildacius tumbled from his fingers and fell to the ground. Sparks flew from the Huey as the bullets torn into it, too. And a burst of flame and smoke poured from a vent on one side of its fuselage. It dipped sharply to one side, and for a second, I thought it was simply going to roll over into the ground. But then it recovered drunkenly, gathering momentum like a car sliding down an icy hill still dragging my friend's unmoving body on the trailing cable like a baited hook at the end of a fishing line and vanished into the darkness. Oh, crap. So Harry's now by himself, and two denarians just appeared next to him from under cover of a veil. 
And he now has to survive. And possibly, because he traded places with Michael, Michael got shot really bad and he went limp. So, yikes. I wonder what's going to happen and how this is all going to work out. Go ahead and leave your comments down below and let's see if we can figure out what Dresden is going to do now that he's all alone in the middle of a uh, scary place. Alarms like that could go off. Anyway, you guys have a wonderful and blessed day.